The History and Uses of Brain Imaging, Foundations of Modern Psychology, Fall 2010. My name is Shay Lowry, and this is my oral presentation for our final class project. The early history of brain science was messy, inaccurate, and lacking in human specimens. Uh, most of this began with Galen and Pergamum around AD 612. Um, he wasn't able to autopsy human beings. He had to perform necropsies on animals, um, mostly uh, roadkill, um, whatever he could find uh, to perform autopsies on. What he observed was a wondrous net of blood vessels at the base of animal brains, particularly, um, in his case, pig brains. This is a picture of a gopher net. Um, humans have kind of something similar, but it's not the same structure. And this is kind of an example of how Galen kind of set the tone for medicine for a millennia, even though most of his um, wisdom was not based on studies with humans and were actually based on studies with animals. He believed that this wondrous net distilled vital spirits from the heart and helped cool the hot humors from the heart. Um, and this is just kind of the beginning of brain science. Leonardo da Vinci around AD 1508, um, this is again look it's almost a millennia later and he's still kind of operating from Galen's perspective. Uh, he also was unable to perform autopsies and had to perform necropsies even though unlike uh, Galen who um, I believe it wasn't illegal in Galen's time to perform necropsies. It was illegal in Da Vinci's time. So he had to perform necropsies on usually things like roadkill. He realized that brain tissue degenerated really quickly, especially um, if you know something that has been dead and it's been on the side of the road for a couple of weeks, it's going to degenerate rather quickly. So he decided to kind of take matters into his own hands. He took an ox, he killed it himself. And then he cracked open its skull and poured in some hot wax. And then once the wax cooled, he scraped off the excess. And what was left was the shape of the ventricles of the brain, which are actually quite similar to um, human ventricles. So that was kind of interesting. And those are actually some of his drawings of the ventricles at the bottom of this slide. Next, we kind of move on to Andreas Vesalius, who's a couple decades later. Uh, Vesalius um, grew tired of uh, just observing animals. He felt that because humans are such a unique animal that we probably have unique anatomy and that we need to study this anatomy on its own. This is a picture of Vesalius uh, scraping the skin off of a corpse to study the muscular structure. This is... Um, picture uh, that he drew of the brain after having just removed the skull. You can see the membrane is still intact. Uh, Vesalius had a unique uh, solution to the illegal autopsies. He decided to rob graves. Uh, this activity uh, forced him out of France. In fact, he never even finished medical school because he was kicked out of school for his deviant activities. He ended up moving to Padua and he was able to conduct public autopsies there because while it was illegal when um, he kind of started there, there was such a push for scientific discovery that um, the government decided to make them legal. So he would perform these public autopsies with hundreds of people. And because he did this, he was able to disprove many of Galen's theories that uh, were laid out um, centuries ago because humans are unique from animals and you can't just 100% generalize um, from a necropsy to an autopsy. Okay, so now we're back at Rene Descartes around 1664. He took on the mind-body conundrum, specifically how can an intangible mind uh, consciousness interact with a physical body? He believed that the pineal gland was the conduit that took information from the mental to the physical and vice versa. Um, one of the first people to see the brain as a mechanism that obeys physical laws. Um, this is actually an example of his work right here. Uh, he, this is a drawing of his with stimuli hitting the eyes, going into this rather oversized pineal gland and being interpreted into muscle movement. Um, 
so he kind of started this idea of the brain as a mechanism, which is kind of similar to like the automata that we had talked about in class in psychology, although he's looking more on a physiological plane. From about Descartes' time to the 19th century, there wasn't a huge amount of progress made in the area of brain science. There was an increased interest in phonology, as you can see here, which was instead of just trying to figure out the function, the structure of brain itself, trying to attribute some functions, which is kind of similar to what was going on um, in psychology at this period. Otto Friedrich Karl Dieters, around 1865. Um, again, you can see we're a couple centuries away from Descartes, but there really wasn't major progress made in uh, the area of neuroscience until this point. Dieters uh, was able to draw a neuron with nothing but sharp eyes and sharp knives, um, which is pretty amazing because a neuron is a fraction size of a human hair. And actually what I have down here is comparison um, with a drawing of Dieters and a picture of a neuron from an electron microscope. As you can see, um, using just his, the naked eye, he was able to be fairly accurate. This is how much work he put into trying to understand the brain. Kimono Golgi, circa 1875, he was a, an Italian psychiatrist. While he was working in a hospital, by accident he discovered that silver makes a series of cells move in a nervous tissue like they, they um, stain in a specific way. He called this the reazione nera, or the black reaction, which is now called Golgi's method. And he was able to use this method to plot the paths of neurons, and it's actually pretty cool. I'll try to illustrate it a little bit. Well, what he would do is he would stain some nervous tissue, and what he would find is it would kind of start off at the body of the neuron around the axon and just kind of start staining up the dendrites and just kind of um, just just keep going in a way where you can kind of trace where the impulse would be going in live tissue. Um, even though Golgi's method was revolutionary, it didn't become very popular. And actually, it took this Spanish histologist we're looking at now, Santiago Ramon Echejo. Um, he read about Golgi's methods and popularized them. And actually, he used this method to come up with a map of the hippocampus that we still kind of use today in some anatomy textbooks. He used the staining and just kind of watched as the stain moved throughout the hippocampus and kind of uh, plotted how impulses might travel through the hippocampus. He hypothesized also that neurons could be discrete units, discrete cells that communicate with one another. This actually, this issue actually polarized the neuroscience community because previous, uh, the previous paradigm had been that nervous tissue is just kind of this big glob of really tightly interconnected cells and the cells cannot be separated. It's actually very similar to the mind-body debate um, that what's going on in psychology, you know, is the mind separable from the body, and it's kind of a reflection of that neuroscience where um, it's, is it the sum of the parts, is it the parts itself, and actually, as we later discovered, um, it's kind of both, you know, the, the neurons can, are separate individual independent units, but when they form together, they form a much greater whole. Now we're into modern brain imaging. These are just some uh, images of PET scans and fMRIs. Um, and we're just going to kind of go over this a little bit. The science behind these images, um, these machines, is a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but I will do my best to kind of explain how they work and what they do. And we're also getting to that point where neuroscience and psychology are really starting to interact. Like, they've been running parallel and kind of similar in terms of their development, but now they're just kind of starting to, to merge and kind of work together. Positron emission tomography was developed in the 1970s. It involves injecting the patient with a radioactive isotope. As the isotope decays, it releases positron emissions, which are picked up by the machine. And actually what I have in this slide is an image of a really old uh, PET scan machine and a really old PET scan. And actually this is an example of the radioactive isotopes lighting up. And actually this in the center is a tumor. 
PET scans today focus on anatomical structure of the individual, uh, like such as seeing a physical tumor on an organ or on the brain. And actually, what you're seeing here with this leaf, this is actually a leaf that has kind of some cancerous uh, tissue. And so that's kind of an interesting comparison with the image we saw in this last slide. This is a modern PET scan view of a brain. Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging um, measures the hemodynamic, or which is the movement of the blood through the brain and the spinal cord. This does not involve radiation. PET scans do involve radiation, and that can also uh, be a concern for some people. Um, fMRIs are increasingly being used in psychological experiments because you can actually interact with an individual and then watch how the blood flow in their brain changes in reaction to the, the social interaction. They're really cool and they're becoming very popular. In conclusion, everything we think, feel, and do begins in the brain. Over the centuries, we have gotten better at understanding this uh, essential piece of what makes us us. I think that neuroscience and psychology working together will help us complete this very important picture. I think especially um, Neuroscience and psychology have kind of had similar developmental paths. Uh, neuroscience began very much very structuralist, uh, very focused on identifying the tiny little parts that make up the whole, and once we understand the parts, we'll understand the whole, and has also moved into this functionalism, just like psychology, where we're kind of more interested in knowing the practical functions of something, and then hopefully getting some understanding of the structure from the function. Um, that was my presentation. Here are my references. Thank you so much for your time and listening, and thank you so much for a great semester, and I hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye.